Welcome to NTD News Today. Here are today's top stories. An emotional visit for former President Trump meeting the wife and baby of a slain NYPD officer. And Presidents Biden meet up with former Presidents Obama and Clinton for a star-studded fundraiser. More on a new record set there. Debris will soon be removed from the Baltimore Bridge that collapsed. Find out more about the latest progress and hear from a victim's family member. Deeply concerning and potentially life-threatening. That's what the Texas Attorney General called the risks of some Boeing models. More on a new investigation. One week after the deadly shooting, a Russian artist recounts her terrifying escape from that Moscow concert hall. The details of her story. Poland dismisses a top general from his position as commander of a European military body. The nation's counterintelligence service is investigating his security clearance. And it looks like the electric vehicle sales friendly, frenzy is coming to a halt. Major dealers are cutting prices and production. We spoke with experts and dealers about this at the 2024 New York Auto Show. This is NTD News Today, live from our NTD Global Headquarters. Here are Stephania Cox and Chris Beers. We open with the latest updates on the bridge that collapsed in Baltimore. Cranes are set to begin removing the wreckage of the bridge. The dolly is almost as long as the Eiffel Tower. And the dolly has the key bridge on top of it. We're talking three to 4,000 tons of steel that's sitting on top of that ship. So we've got work to do. At least two cranes will be used to clear the channel. One of them is the largest crane on the eastern seaboard and can lift up to 1,000 tons. The Biden administration approved $60 million in immediate aid. Officials say they have to start clearing the wreckage before anyone can reach the bodies of the four missing workers. Using sonar equipment, authorities say they saw vehicles that appear to be encased in a superstructure of concrete and other debris. A victim's family is urging authorities to keep up search efforts. We are still waiting with faith and hope that they will find the body of our brother so that we can start the repatriation process, which is what we are most interested in. So, God willing, tomorrow the government will take another decision. In addition to removing the metal structures of the bridge, they will also continue with the search for the bodies. This man's brother was among eight construction workers filling potholes on the bridge when it collapsed. He's from Honduras. Authorities halted body recovery efforts because of dangerous conditions. A busy day for presidential hopefuls wraps up. President Biden and former President Obama headlined a star-studded fundraiser with former President Bill Clinton. And former President Trump attended the wake of a New York City police officer gunned down in the line of duty. NTD's Daniel Monahan has more on the two events. Former President Trump was in Massapequa, Long Island on Thursday at the wake of Officer Jonathan Diller. Diller, a three-year veteran of the force, was fatally shot below his bulletproof vest during a traffic stop on Monday in Queens. He was rushed to a hospital where he died. Two suspects have been taken into custody. Trump commented on the lengthy rap sheet of the suspected killer. We're just not going to let it happen. We just get 21 times arrested. Yes. Thug. And uh, the person in the car with him was arrested many times. And they don't learn because they don't respect they don't, they're not given the respect. The former president visited with the fallen officer's wife. Their child, brand new, beautiful baby, swinging their innocent as can be, and doesn't know how his life has been changed. Trump called for change, saying such deaths are happening far too often. President Biden was also in New York on Thursday. He arrived on Air Force One with his old boss, former President Barack Obama. Biden took part in a discussion with Clinton, moderated by The Late Show host Stephen Colbert, at Radio City Music Hall in front of thousands of guests. Musicians who performed included Queen Latifah, Lizzo, Ben Platt, Cynthia Erivo, and Leah Michelle. 
Some high-paying attendees had their pictures with the three presidents taken by celebrity photographer Annie Leibovitz. The fundraiser was punctuated by several protests inside the massive auditorium, with attendees rising at several different moments to shout over the discussion. They called out Biden's backing of Israel and its war with the Hamas terror group. One yelled, shame on you, Joe Biden. Pro-Palestinian protesters also gathered outside the event, yelling slogans like, free, free Palestine, and genocide Joe has got to go. At least one protester was taken into custody. Organizers say the event raised more than $25 million for Biden's re-election campaign. That's a new single event fundraising record. Tickets reportedly cost between $250 and $500,000 per person. Former President Trump will try to top that next week. Trump is inviting wealthy donors to his Mar-a-Lago estate in Palm Beach, Florida. The fundraiser will take place on April 6th and will be hosted by New York hedge fund billionaire John Paulson. Guests can give over $800,000 as a chairman contributor or $250,000 per person. Those in attendance will get a personalized copy of Trump's coffee table book with photographs from his administration. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. How successful was Biden's fundraiser for his campaign? And did it hurt his image? Joining us now is NTD business host, is NTD news contributor Mike Leon. Here's, he's also the policy and strategy director of the Free Equal Election Foundation and host of the news commentary podcast, Can We Please Talk? Mike, great to have you back. Uh, talk to me about, the, about President Biden and former President Trump's dueling visits to New York yesterday. Hey, Chris, here first and foremost. Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the dueling visits, uh, for people that don't know the story of, of the officer that you just played there in the package, Jonathan Diller, and the issues behind that and why former President Trent, um, kudos to him for going to the wake, first and foremost, the issues around, you know, bail and the, and the criminal that shot the police officer. I, I would encourage everybody to go read that story because it's horrible. And we should all be on the side of, of back in the blue and law enforcement here. And so he decided to go to, to that wake yesterday, where in contrast, obviously, uh, current President Biden decided to do the event at Radio City Music Hall, which is obviously his right. And, and he's in the middle of, of, a, of an election right now in 2024 that's pivotal. He's trying to get reelected. This is kind of like a once in a lifetime opportunity for him to be able to have all of these different celebrities that were mentioned there in the package. And, and they were able to raise around twenty six million dollars for his campaign. So, you know, my overall takeaways on all of this, again, this is, New York is a blue state. So uh, former President Trump is not going to win New York by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but, you know, kudos to him for going out there to 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 visit the, uh, the family out there in Long Island. And what do you think the optics of these two different uh, events are? Well, the optics, I mean, for voters, I mean, you guys saw it there in the package, you know, the pro-Palestine voice right now. You know, President Biden really has to worry about that because we've seen the uncommitted vote across different states. People are upset with the way the war is playing out. And again, the U.S. has no troops on the ground in Israel, but they are funding a lot of Israel's weapons, right? And so you would think funding the weapons would help to the strategy. The strategy should be get the hostages back safe and sound and obviously not, you know, uh, destroy Gaza and kill all of these innocent Palestinians that did not vote for Hamas, this terrorist organization. So he's going to have to continue to figure out how to message to those people right now to get them to vote for him in November. The optics on the other side for former President Trump is, you know, he, Republicans always run on the campaign of, you know, backing the blue and law and order. And he can take that message to Republican voters. Again, New York, blue state, more registered Democrats. So it won't work particularly in that state, but it could work in states that are, are in the surrounding areas. And that it's more of a national message that he can take to his fundraising base, like you just heard in the package on April 6th, and say, look, you know, we did this event. We were able to help pay for the wake and the funeral for this slain officer up in New York City when President Biden was doing something else. Yeah, and the something else he was doing was raising $25, 26000000 million in a single day. Uh, it's a massive sum of money. How to compare and contrast Biden and Trump's uh, fundraising efforts? Yeah, well, right now, I mean, if people don't remember this, after the State of the Union address, uh, President Biden was able to raise around 10 to $12 million off of that night. I, I was talking to a former, uh, not former, a current uh, House member right now on the Democratic side about this, that President Biden's fundraising has started to take off in the last 
few weeks and, and President Trump's has kind of cooled down a little bit, even though he has the true social going public uh, and he's had other fundraising measures. Obviously, he launched a sneaker brand recently, which sold out within you know, 24 hours. So he's trying other means of, of, of raising money uh, from a personal business side that could, uh, you know, uh, funnel into the campaign. But right now, President Biden is getting a lot of donations and, and it speaks volumes to Democrats being able to kind of hone in their message uniformly, which is something that Republicans were always good at, always being on the same page. Democrats were always all over the place in, in terms of messaging. And, you know, I, you've seen some people that are on the Republican side and conservative media start to voice this, saying that we need to kind of get a line on the Republican side because Democrats are, are fundraising, you know, out the wazoo right now. Yeah, I mean, what could this fundraising do in terms of Biden's ground game? Charlie Kirk is saying that uh, he has about 5,000 full-time organizers right now. Yeah, I mean, for Charlie Kirk to tweet out something in praise of the Democrats, I mean, should be blowing all of our heads out of the water right now. I mean, because Charlie Kirk would never do that. And I think it's it's a message. It's a salvo to the Republican base. But the problem is, and again, we've talked about this on the show, Chris, is that right now the Republicans are divided. We had an immigration bill that a senator introduces on the Republican side. We can't get it passed. Representative Chip Roy is on the House floor saying, what am I supposed to take back to my constituents in Texas showing that we've been able to do? And so I think that's kind of been why a little bit of the dip on the Republican side. Republicans need to get unified on this message right now. They need to go out there and champion some of the things that former President Trump was able to do back in 2018, 2019, pre-pandemic. Stick on that message because those are the issues that people are going to talk about. And then the secondary part of this, and you've seen kind of uh, former President Trump do this a little bit on True Social. He's been killing the Biden administration, saying that he's more pro-Israel, obviously, than than President Biden. And you saw the protests yesterday of the pro-Palestinian crowd there that are, are chanting the different chants and saying that they want yeah. the human rights aspect of this to be taken serious. So I think that's what Republicans need to message on right now from a unified stamp, because Democrats are seen to get in line. All right, Mike Leon, thank you for your insight. Policy and Strategy Director of the Free and Equal Election Foundation. Thanks, Chris. Georgia now has tighter election rules. The changes involve challenging voter eligibility and qualifying for the state's presidential ballot. The move could impact the 2024 presidential race in the battleground state. The bill would allow any political party that is qualified for the presidential ballot in at least 20 states on Georgia's ballot. That could be a boost to independent candidates such as Robert F. Kennedy Jr. The bill also spells out what constitutes probable cause for upholding challenges to voter eligibility that could lead to voters being removed from the rolls. Probable cause would exist if someone is dead or if they've already voted or are registered to vote in a different jurisdiction. Democrats criticized the provision. They say it would overwhelm election administrators and disenfranchise voters. And calls to impeach a January 6th judge after he criticized former President Trump on a cable news program. It all started with Trump's criticism of another judge and their family member. District Judge Reggie Waltons responded on CNN by expressing concern about his remarks. Walton said authority figures need to be cautious with their words to prevent potential harm. Some commentators like Julie Kelly and Josh Hammer advocated for impeachment proceedings against Judge Walton. Others, like Mike Davis, called for a judicial misconduct complaint. Judge Walton has presided over cases related to the January 6, 2021 Capitol breach. He had previously voiced skepticism about Trump's commitment to democracy during sentencing hearings. And a top Georgia GOP official is in the hot seat over voting illegally. A judge says Brian Pritchard illegally voted nine times while on probation for felony convictions and fined him $5,000. Despite being ineligible to vote until 2011, Pritchard registered in 2008. He claimed in a sworn statement at the time that he wasn't serving a felony sentence. The judge found Pritchard's explanation unconvincing, stating that he should have known about his felon felony sentences. Pritchard stated in the past that he wanted to improve election integrity. He also questioned the legitimacy of the 2020 election results. And South Carolina has a new electoral map for its congressional elections this year. A federal court reversed its decision. It previously deemed the same map unconstitutional and discriminatory against black voters. 
The judges explained their decision yesterday. They said there is no other plan in place right now. And with the primaries fast approaching, quote, the ideal must bend to the practical. South Carolina's primary election will be on June 11th. Voting starts in late May, but the deadline for absentee ballots is April 27th. The new district map was drawn in 2022 by state Republicans. Civil rights groups cried foul, saying it was the worst option available for black voters. They accused the makers of gerrymandering, redrawing the electoral borders to disenfranchise black voters and to secure a seat for GOP candidates. Last year, a three-judge panel concluded that the map was fairly unfairly exiled tens of thousands of voters. The state appealed the decision. The same panel said yesterday a lack of action from the Supreme Court meant the map would be used in the upcoming election. The Republican National Committee is challenging Michigan's handling of absentee ballots. A lawsuit filed yesterday alleges Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson violated state law. It says she instructed election officials not to properly verify the identity of absentee voters. The lawsuit alleges that Benson spoke privately to election officials and instructed them to presume the validity of the signatures without actually verifying them. The RNC filed another lawsuit against Benson earlier this month. It accused Michigan of failing to live up to the National Voters Registration Act's requirements by having more active voters on roll than adult citizens. In a previous statement to the Epoch Times, Benson said that lawsuit was meritless. The RNC is also opening dozens of offices across the country and recruiting hundreds of workers over the next month. This just a few weeks after the organization fired a large portion of its staff. House Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer has invited President Biden to testify publicly as part of the GOP's impeachment inquiry. This comes after two of Hunter Biden's former business associates testified in February. Comer yesterday suggested an April 16th hearing date, but said he could negotiate with the White House on that timing. House Oversight Chair James Comer says Americans need to hear from the president himself. He says that way President Biden can explain why his family received tens of millions of dollars from foreign companies with his assistance. The committee says it found no legitimate services to merit such payments. In response, House Democrats called the probe comically distorted and twisted and suggested the inquiry be put to rest. The White House called Comer's invitation a sad stunt. Hunter Biden earlier testified that his father was not involved in any business dealings. Coming up, deeply concerning and potentially life-threatening. That's what the Texas Attorney General called the risks of some Boeing models. More on a new investigation after the break. And the Biden administration's climate efforts are seeing a bit of a setback. A Texas judge is blocking a rule forcing carbon emissions disclosure. More in just a moment here on NTD News Today. We've been spending a lot more time than ever at home these days. So maybe now you've just noticed cold air coming in from a couple windows or that your patio door isn't closing fully, which means you're losing heat in the winter, losing cooling in the summer, losing money all year long. And that means now is the time for new windows and patio doors from Renewal by Anderson. Most installations are usually done in just one day. Renewal by Anderson windows and doors can help lower your heating bills and air conditioning bills with their most energy efficient glass available. Only their windows are made with Fibrex material proven to be two times stronger than vinyl and they're backed by a 20 year warranty. And right now, when you buy one window or patio door, get one at 40% off. Plus, there's no money down, no payments for 12 months, and no interest for 12 months. Plus, an additional $200 off your entire purchase. 1-800-968-1443. There's a whirlwind of emotion and activity going on in this painting and this chaos all around, and threat from below. The wolves surrounding her, and they're anything but unmoved. They're moving all the time, and we sense that. But this little girl remains unmoved. She's in quite a perilous situation, but she's completely strong and serene, and she's actually meditating. 
it was very, very well liked because no matter what culture or what sort of walk of life you're from, I think people, they see it and they immediately understand what that energy, what that message is, and they, they're they drawn to it because everybody kind of needs a little bit of that in their own life, of, you know, the steadfast calmness and something to hold on to. It's definitely an inner peace in the midst of something very chaotic, and for a lot of people right now, the whole world is very, very chaotic, so I guess that's another reason why so many people are very drawn to this. It's time. Post -o -jella. Post -o -jella. Donating pet food is one of the many ways you can help families in your community. Pets and people belong together. Learn more at petsandpeopletogether.org. Join us on NTD Good Morning because we want you to stay informed. Kickstart your morning with the latest you missed overnight. Right, and don't forget that inspiration. Absolutely, so let's shine some light on the good news too. Tune in every weekday morning to NTD News. Welcome back. A group of red states is lining up against the Biden administration's latest student loan forgiveness program. Eleven Republican attorneys general are suing the Biden administration over the SAVE plan student loan cancellation scheme. They argue that it's illegal because Congress didn't approve it. The Supreme Court blocked President Biden's plan to cancel $430 billion in student loan debt in 2023. So the administration introduced a new income-driven repayment plan for student debt forgiveness. There are concerns that the program's actual cost could exceed estimates and about taxpayers footing the bill. Kansas Attorney General Chris Kobach is leading the lawsuit. And Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton has opened an investigation into a Boeing parts supplier. The move comes after what he called recurring issues with some parts. Paxton said Thursday the potential risks with certain airplane models are, quote, deeply concerning and potentially life-threatening to Texans. The supplier's name is Spirit Aerosystems. Boeing and Spirit Aerosystems have been under recent scrutiny for safety and quality. On Monday, Boeing CEO Dave Calhoun announced he would leave by the end of the year. This follows concerns from regulators and airline customers after a panel blew off a 737 MAX 9 jet in January. A Spirit Aerosystems spokesperson said the company is focused on providing their customers with the best quality product. And Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin vetoed two bills yesterday. The first bill aimed to kickstart recreational retail sales of marijuana next year, while the second sought to enforce a minimum wage increase. Virginia became the first southern state to legalize marijuana in 2021. It adopted a policy change that allowed adults 21 and up to possess and cultivate the drug. But the state didn't set up retail sales at the time and still hasn't. Advocates say the disconnect is allowing the black market to flourish. Opponents have raised health and safety concerns regarding the further expansion of marijuana access. Youngkin has said he shared those concerns. Regarding the minimum wage legislation, Youngkin said the bill would create drastic wage mandates, raise costs on families and small businesses, jeopardize jobs, and failed to recognize regional economic differences across Virginia. The current minimum wage in Virginia is $12 per hour. The proposal would push it to $13.50 in 2025 and $15 an hour in 2026. And the Rockford, Illinois community came together yesterday to remember four people killed in a stabbing spree. The stabbings happened early Wednesday afternoon in a residential area. Mother and son Ramona and Jacob Shabak were among the victims. The other victims were 15-year-old Jenna Newcomb and 49-year-old postal worker Jay Larson. The suspect, 22-year-old Christian Soto, remains in custody. Rockford police said a motive for the stabbings is yet to be determined. And that was Shubak there, the two 
family members that were involved. Soto faces four counts of murder and seven counts of attempted murder, as well as two counts of home invasion with a dangerous weapon. That was my brother. Like, right now, I don't, I don't even know what to say. I don't even know what to think, because this whole thing is a tragedy. My dad once told me to always live so they don't have to lie at your funeral. Jay lived. Nobody's got to lie about how much they loved him. She was always there to make sure that I had somebody because I didn't really know a lot of the people. So she helped, like, fit in. And New York City will begin testing gun detecting technology in a pilot program at several subway stations. The announcement comes after several shootings on the subway system. Mayor Eric Adams announced yesterday that the NYPD will soon begin testing portable scanning machines at several stations. City law requires a 90-day notice period for the introduction of new surveillance technology. Adams, a former police officer, said this was the next step in keeping the New York City transit system safe. Police have seized 19 guns from people in the transit system so far this year, compared with nine guns in the same period in 2023. And the Legal Aid Society, which defends New Yorkers who cannot afford lawyers, called the plan, plan misguided and an invasion of privacy. An attorney with the organization said gun detection systems are flawed and frequently trigger false alarms, which could induce panic. Nearly four million trips are made on the city's subway on a typical weekday. New York, city, New York State banned people from having guns in what it designates as sensitive locations, including public transportation, in 2022. The ruling is being challenged by gun rights advocates. Next up, joining us is the host of NTD's Business Matters, Don Ma, to give us the latest updates from the tech and business world. Don, welcome. Thank you. What's happening out there, Don? Uh, so just a couple things I wanted to talk to you guys about, and one of them is about Easter, and the other one is about carbon emissions. Very different topics here. I'll start with the carbon emissions here. So a judge in Texas actually struck down a Biden administration rule uh, that requires states to measure and report the greenhouse emissions from vehicles uh, using the national highway system. So this rule was issued actually by the U.S. Department of Transportation and was part of uh, President Biden's efforts to slash carbon emissions by half in uh, 2030. So Texas sued the DOT in December, arguing that the agency lacked a legal authority uh, from Congress to enact the rule and that it violates the Administrative Procedure Act. Now, in the ruling, uh, Judge James Hendricks of the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Texas agreed with that. He stated that the Biden administration did not have the ability under law to impose the greenhouse gas emissions performance measure. And the judge wrote that, quote, when a regulation attempts to override statutory text, the regulation loses every time. Regulations can't punch holes in the rules Congress has laid down. All right, and with Easter right around the corner, how are chocolate prices looking? Yep, that's the million dollar question. But unfortunately, it seems like prices could be going up because not even the Easter Bunny can escape inflation, wow. at least for this year. So you can expect your Easter basket to uh, cost a lot more this year. Um, and that's because chocolate prices are surging and experts say it could get worse, actually. Retail chocolate prices rose over 11% in 2023 and cocoa futures are up 250% from last March. So experts are now pointing to adverse weather conditions and crop diseases in West Africa, where 70% uh, of the world's cocoa is produced, by the way. So to combat rising costs and dwindling supply, many candy companies uh, are touting other options to fill out Easter baskets. So in, 20, uh, in 2023, non-chocolate and gummy candy saw a 12% increase. So uh, not looking too good, it seems like. Maybe that would explain why I paid $11.50 for a chocolate crepe yesterday. Ooh, sounds nice, though. Yeah, well, yeah, I guess the Easter Bunny really cannot escape inflation. <laughs> All right, thank you, Don. Thank you, thank you, Don. Up next, Poland dismisses a top general from his position as commander of a European military body. The move comes after the nation's counterintelligence service launched an investigation into his security clearance. 
And one week after a deadly shooting, a Russian artist recounts her terrifying escape from the concert hall in Moscow. The details of her story when we return. Say goodbye to harsh, bitter coffee and hello to a delicious, smooth brew. With specialty quality beans, expertly roasted in-house, you'll taste the difference with every sip. Fermented with a blend of 50 enzymes, Day's Coffee delivers a rich brew like no other. Made with the highest grade specialty beans available, you're sure to taste the difference. Elevate your morning with Day's Enzyme Fermented Coffee. This is it, the culmination of everything our young athlete has worked for these past months. He's filled with determination. You can see it in his face. Is today the day he overcomes? And here we go. There is no defense in the world that will keep him at bay. He's on fire. Nothing can stop him. Watch him as he heads towards the goal. Oh, he's blocked hard. But that doesn't stop him. He's a warrior. He's back up. His eyes are on the goal. He's set up for the shot. He shoots. Goal! Achieving goals like this is only possible with the monthly support of people just like you. Please call the number on your screen right now and give your monthly support to Shriners Hospitals for Children so other children can reach their goals too. If you give just $19 a month, only 63 cents a day, we will send you your very own Love to the Rescue Blanket as a reminder of the love you're giving us. Because of monthly support of people like you, nothing is stopping me from achieving my goals. And here we go. There is no defense in the world that will keep him at bay. He's going left. Oh, he fakes right and continues. Look at those moves. He takes the shot. Goal! Good shot. <laughs> Please call or go online now. If operators are busy, call again or go to loveshriners.org to give right away. Your monthly gift helps kids achieve their goals. Goal! My graduation was something I will never forget. People like you and me sometimes may have doubts in yourself, but I feel that everything's possible. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. Thank you for staying with us. A Russian court rejected an appeal from journalist Evan Gershkovich against extended detention. The Kremlin said prisoner exchange discussions for the Wall Street Journal writer are ongoing, but must be carried out in silence. The Moscow court Tuesday upheld the decision by a lower court to extend the journalist's detention until June 30th. He's been behind bars for a year now. Russia's security service accused Gershkovich of being a spy a charge he and the Wall Street Journal have denied. If convicted, Gershkovich faces, faces up to 20 years in prison. The Kremlin says there are ongoing negotiations regarding a potential prisoner swap that could send the journalist back to the U.S., but a government spokesperson said these conversations would remain secret. The Wall Street Journal today is commemorating the one-year anniversary of the detention of Gershkovich. The paper intentionally left out a large section of its front page blank to represent the missing work from him. The blank space is accompanied by these words. A year in Russian prison, a year of stolen stories, stolen joys, stolen memories. The crime, journalism. The journal says it will also print dispatches on Gershkovich and put a spotlight on the destructive consequences of authoritarian regimes. It's been one week since the deadly shooting at a Moscow music venue. Dozens of people are still missing. A Russian artist recounts the harrowing moment she escaped the attack. Just a warning, this report contains graphic images. 
Я всех люблю, Крокус Сити Холл, пикник. Здесь на концерте This was part of a 10-second audio message Russian artist Alona Kazhinskaya posted on her Telegram channel. The night four gunmen rampaged through Crocus City Hall near Moscow. That first message came at 8.01 p.m. after Kazhinskaya and a friend had bought last-minute tickets to see Soviet-era rock group Picnic. I heard shooting. I realized it wasn't scripts. At first, I thought maybe it's a special effect, but then no. It doesn't sound like that. So I poked my friend and she said, people, get up, let's run. At 8.08 p.m., she wrote three messages on her phone in quick succession. Please ring the police, Crocus City Hall, shooting. Kaczynskaya and her friend had managed to escape the hall, but found themselves still trapped inside the building. The shooting stopped, but there was now another danger, fire. The gunmen had used gasoline to set the huge concert hall ablaze, and the two friends took refuge in a toilet. They tried half a dozen times to get out, but were forced to keep retreating. At 8.23 p.m., she left a four-second audio message. She thought it would be her last. I love you. Goodbye. Then, eight minutes later, at 8.31 p.m., Another message. I'm alive. I'm in an ambulance. I got out. Thank you. I didn't realize I was safe. I had only two thoughts. First, I need first aid because I can't breathe. My lungs were burning. And I was having an asthma attack. And the second thought was, I have to get as far away from the building as I can. Get behind the cars as fast as possible. Because if something happens, I'm a target. I'm in white. Those two thoughts, and somehow I made my way forward. Returning home, Kashinskaya says she just hugged everyone. She says she draws comfort from the amount of support she has received, but that it will be a long time before she goes to clubs or big concerts again. And here are some more headlines from Europe. A Russian veto yesterday ended a UN program. The UN is no longer monitoring sanctions against North Korea over its nuclear program. The West accused Moscow of violating the sanctions to buy weapons from Pyongyang for its war in Ukraine. Russia's veto marks growing animosity toward the U.S. and its Western allies since Moscow's invasion of Ukraine more than two years ago. The U.N. Security Council resolution would have extended the mandatory monitoring of North Korea's nuclear program for a year. The current mandate expires at the end of April. The actual sanctions against North Korea remain in effect. Japan's chief cabinet secretary called Russia's veto regrettable. The UN Security Council had renewed the expert panel annually for 14 years. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said he called Speaker of the House Mike Johnson yesterday. The Speaker has held up a bill for months that would supply $60 billion in military and financial aid for Ukraine. The Louisiana Republican has indicated he will attempt to pass the bill for wartime funding for Ukraine as well as Israel once the House returns in April. Ukrainian troops have lost momentum on the battlefield, facing shortages of artillery supplies. U.S. assistance has been held up in Congress and the European Union. Zelensky said the brief, he briefed Johnson about the situation on the battlefield. Poland has dismissed a top general from his position as commander of a European military body. The country's defense ministry made the announcement this week after the country's counterintelligence service launched an investigation into his security clearance. The lieutenant general had been serving as commander of Eurocorps since June 2023. Germany and France found the Corps in founded the Corps in 1992 to support various European Union and NATO missions. The group's six framework nations include Belgium, Spain, Luxembourg and Poland. The Eurocorps has embarked on missions in the Balkans, Afghanistan and Africa. The Polish officer had also served in Iraq and was a commander in Poland's military. Poland's defense ministry said it will appoint a replacement immediately. 
Poland says it will send troops and canine handlers to help secure the Olympic Games in France. The French government raised the country's terror alert warning to its highest level on Sunday following the Moscow Concert Hall attack. A Polish military spokesperson said details of the arrangement were still being worked out and would be provided at a later date. In mid-March, Paris authorities strengthened the police presence in a suburb near the Paris 2024 Olympic Village. Demonstrators protesting the death of a young man in a nearby town attacked a police station in the suburb on March 17th. The suspect had refused to stop his motorbike during a police chase earlier this month. The Paris Summer Olympic Games kick off on July 26th. And Turkey's president is set to visit the United States on May 9th. It's the first White House meeting during President Biden's administration. In 2019, he met then-President Donald Trump. Turkey has been seeking another face-to-face -face meeting since Biden's election in 2020. Relations between Turkey and NATO have improved since it ratified Sweden's NATO membership bid in January. A 20-month delay had caused frustration in Washington. Yet problems persist, including over north, northern Syria. U.S. forces there are allied with Kurdish militants that Turkey deems terrorists. Washington has also pressed Turkey to do more to stop goods flowing to Russia for Moscow's war efforts in Ukraine. And up ahead, hand-painted eggs and the ancient art of egg shoeing. How two Bosnian artisans are keeping these Eastern traditions alive. And it looks like the electric vehicle sales frenzy is coming to a halt. Major dealers are cutting prices and production. We spoke with experts and dealers about this at the, new, at the 2024 New York Auto Show. More shortly here on NTD News Today. A troubling agenda revealed certain Western media outlets are publishing content in line with propaganda from a tyrannical regime, the Chinese Communist Party, at least when it comes to a major human rights violation committed against practitioners of the Falun Gong spiritual movement inside China. And at the center of that problem, really, unfortunately, is the paper of record, the New York Times. Why was this journalism so off the mark? And so here was the leadership of the New York Times meeting with the leadership of the largest tyrannical communist regime on earth. Watch our exclusive interview with Levi Browdy, executive director of the Falun Dafa Information Center, this Saturday on NTD, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. I have never seen a production any better than this anywhere. Breathtaking. It is absolutely stunning. I feel better about the world. I feel uplifted invigorating, it was encouraging, gave me hope. This has just been therapy for the soul. It's a must-see, must-see. Make sure you see it. Make sure you see it. Coming to Lincoln Center, NJ Pack, State Theater, Purchase, and Stamford. Genuine.com. The ninth International Chinese Vocal Competition is scheduled to take place in New York City in September 2024. We are proud to announce that this year's panel of judges will include distinguished vocalists from the globally acclaimed Shen Yun Performing Arts. The prestigious Gold Award includes a $10,000 prize. For additional details, please visit vocal.ntdtv.com. When I drink it, the first thing was it, I feel the warmth in my, in my tummy. It's kind of like it's gently radiating out, you know, a kind of a very comforting warm. And it was really good, actually. I felt uh, uh, much better. I did feel, actually, an effect. And I find that it is actually better when I take it regularly. It's actually steamed and dried nine times. And so it's really, the essence is really extracted. Then a second time, I tried it really like on an empty stomach and just, just two, two teaspoons of it and over a few times. And wow, that was a big difference because suddenly I could feel, why wow, I was very good energized. I didn't have to eat. I could work outside in the garden for a couple of hours and I still felt very well. And I was impressed by that. So I think it's a good product. If you're living with diabetes, this is the sound that could change your life. 
great news for people living with diabetes. Now you can wear a continuous glucose monitor and eliminate routine finger sticks. The days of repeated painful finger sticks are over. Just call 800-215-1658. If you use insulin daily to manage your condition, a continuous glucose monitor could help you control your diabetes and reduce or eliminate those painful finger sticks. If you have Medicare or private insurance, US Med can deliver a CGM system right to your door. And if you qualify, there may be little or no cost to you. Shipping is free and we'll even bill your insurer directly. Call now to get your continuous glucose monitoring system so you can take control of your diabetes and get back to enjoying life. Just call 800-215-1658. That's 800-215-1658. I'm Iris Tao at the White House, and we are NTD. Are electric vehicles on their way out? Not exactly, but EV sales are seeing a slump. Tesla, Ford, and GM are all slashing EV prices. Ford is slowing down production on its electric F-150 Lightning. And Mercedes-Benz says it won't meet the 20, its 2025 EV and hybrid sales goals. There are plenty of other signs as well. I was at the New York Auto Show talking with experts and auto dealers about the future of electric vehicles. Here's that report. So we know electric vehicles are seeing a slump in sales right now, but why is this happening? To answer that question, I'm joined by, right next to me, Lauren Fix, the car coach and automotive expert. Lauren, talk to me about this. Well, you know, it's funny, the government's mandating electric vehicles and consumers are thinking, I don't know if this works for me, but how you can tell what the results are is go buy any dealer lot and there's tons of electric vehicles. So the manufacturers have delivered on really cool product that gives what they've promised. Unfortunately, the electric grid is not there, whether you charge at home or you charge on the road, it doesn't necessarily work for our lifestyle. And the pushback has been dramatic and people are now looking at hybrids. The EV market took off in 2021 and 2022. The leader of Ford's EV division, Marin Gaia, told CNBC that it was a temporary market spike. He said demand is still growing, but not nearly at the expected rate. Another factor behind slow EV sales is price. The average, $60,000 in 2023. It's also putting a charging station in your home by a certified electrician. Check with your insurance company because they're going to increase your rates as well for your home insurance. And if you're renting or you're staying at a place that's not, that doesn't have a garage, well, there's no place to charge, which brings you to going to public charging, which costs money. A Boston Consulting Group study found that people would buy electric vehicles that charge in 20 minutes or less, go for more than 350 miles and cost less than $50,000. Only one car on the market meets this standard right now. The Hyundai Ioniq 6SE rear wheel drive long range. Despite this, one dealer we spoke with seems optimistic. Yeah, so I mean, the EV sales are still growing, right? I think there's a misconception out there that they're not performing. Uh, they are still on a growing trend. Last year, 2023, was the best year ever with over a million EV sales here in the U.S. Uh, and so that market continues to grow. But Cox Automotive said in its 2025 industry report, expectations for EV growth in the U.S. have shifted from rosy to reality as sales increase. Cox says customer acceptance of EVs isn't keeping pace. This goes against the Biden administration's push for EVs. Well, the Biden administration is all about the Green New Deal, pushing electric vehicles on a global basis. That's part of the World Economic Forum's platform. We know that. You can read it. Anybody can see that. However, the problem is, as you're pushing it here in the United States, Americans buy what they want, and that's SUVs. They're buying trucks, and those do not meet the current government's uh, demand. The president is facing an uphill battle for EV adoption, and his administration's efforts could come to a halt depending on who wins the 2024 presidential race. Former President Donald Trump is expected to undo fuel economy mandates if he's elected again. That means manufacturers and consumers alike face EV uncertainty. Chris Beers, NTD News. And in health news, blueberries, cherries, and raspberries possess anti-aging and heart-protective properties. Let's find out more. Here's Gina Marie from Strong Mind and Body. Here 
Blueberries are rich in vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. In this video, we'll introduce you to blueberries, cherries, and raspberries. These are noteworthy because of their anti-aging and heart protective properties. These fruits reduce the risk of heart disease and offer various additional health benefits. Let's start by discussing blueberries. The nutritional value of blueberries is exceptionally high. They contribute to the prevention of cardiovascular diseases. Research has found that blueberries exhibit anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effects. They are also beneficial for blood sugar regulation. Eating one third of a cup of blueberries daily can reduce the risk of cardiovascular diseases, type 2 diabetes and all-cause mortality. Blueberries also offer health benefits for other parts of the body. They protect the eyes and relieve eye strain. They nourish the kidneys and delay aging. They also maintain gut health and facilitate bowel movements. Next, let's look at cherries. Cherries can improve blood circulation and safeguard heart health. Research has shown that cherries are rich in bioactive compounds such as anthocyanins, quercetin, potassium, vitamin C, fiber, carotenoids, and melatonin. These compounds offer potential preventative effects against cardiovascular diseases, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, and inflammatory conditions. Cherries also offer health benefits for other parts of the body. They enrich blood and enhance complexion. They reduce gout risk and improve arthritis. And they also protect the brain and enhance memory. And finally, let's look at raspberries. Research has found that consuming raspberries can significantly reduce risk factors associated with cardiovascular diseases. They can also alleviate nocturia, improve diabetes and reduce creasiness. Adding raspberries to yogurt or cereal enhances the flavor with a delightfully sweet and tart taste. Slightly sour raspberry jam pairs well with cooked meat slices because it neutralizes greasiness and adds a delicious touch. Blueberries, cherries, and raspberries all offer heart protection and various health benefits, as you can see. However, it is essential to consume them in moderation, as a balanced diet is the key to promoting overall health and well-being. And with Easter approaching, some artisans in Bosnia are keeping their traditional crafts alive. One woman decorates her Easter eggs by hand using ink and beeswax. Another is an expert in 14th century art of egg shoeing. Let's look at these unique traditions. Generations of know-how and over 60 years of practice. That's what it takes to decorate Easter eggs by hand that look this good. Her mother showed Miroslava Ivicevic the technique as a little girl. She's kept it alive ever since. Each year in the run-up to Easter, she sits at her kitchen table, carefully adorning each egg in beeswax. The women who came before us were resourceful. They did not have different dyes to choose from. They did not have many ornaments. But they had honeybees, and they had beeswax from combs, which they themselves melted. So they used that for decoration, because when you apply beeswax to an egg, what you draw with it will never wash away. The 70-year-old has developed her own style over time, and many of her designs incorporate symbols related to Bosnia. But she says there are no rules when it comes to egg decorating. You let your imagination run free. The only important thing is that the eggs be beautiful and nicely decorated. Nearby, another local artisan is also hard at work. Stjepan Bilatek and a handful of others still practice the 14th century art of egg shoeing. Bilatek is the oldest and most experienced practitioner in his field. He has a deep knowledge of the history of this unusual craft. He says it was developed as a way of testing blacksmith apprentices. Shopmasters agreed what to do and they informed their apprentices that they consider them fit to start their own shops once they managed to shoe an egg. A commission of masters would be established to inspect these eggs to see if they cracked or not. If the eggs cracked, apprentices had to take the test again. If not, if their eggs were accepted by the commission, the eggs were considered to be their graduation diploma. People treasure his work and value the eggs as gifts. One of his eggs can last hundreds of years if it remains unbroken. Especially around Easter, more people come to buy eggs for presents. Once the holidays are over and they go back to places where they live, they take these eggs with them as gifts. During the 1990s, war in Bosnia displaced hundreds of local residents to other countries. 
Now it's a tradition for former residents to return to the town each spring to celebrate Easter and buy traditional gifts to take home. For round the clock original news coverage, visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. And be sure to stick around for NTD Newsroom with Stephanie Cox at 3 p.m. Eastern. She'll cover more stories from the U.S. and around the world. And we wish you and your loved ones a happy, wonderful, happy Easter this weekend. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. What's happened to this world we're living in? Why? For the four years he has been on this earth, he has known nothing but war. Wherever I go, the things I see, I just want to turn away. The dreams I have, the stories I could tell, will they still be possible? This year, more than ever, I need a brand new world. A clean world. Where I can improve myself and be inspired. My stage can be anywhere and everywhere but it begins here. Changing World, a brighter way of life. Is deep sea fish oil really healthy? Due to pollution in the oceans, most fish contain heavy metal elements and radioactive substances. That's why it's so important to choose a pure source of omega-3. Puritan green vegetable omega-3 is made from purslane and perillocene, which are rich in nutrients and minerals, especially vitamins A, D, E, calcium and iron. With natural processing and no harmful chemical additives, it has more than 90% concentration of omegas 3, 6, 7 and 9. It effectively improves brain power and is beneficial to the heart's health. Puritan Omega-3 does not smell fish and contains no pollutants, so both adults and children can safely and easily consume it over a long period of time. Puritan Green Vegetable Omega-3. Greener, healthier, and more effective. Visit puritan.com to learn more. I didn't ask to lose my mother or to be abused at five years old. I didn't ask to be kicked out of my house with nowhere to go. Just can't. I didn't ask for any of this. But I did ask for help, and Covenant House was there. Thanks to their love and support, and to generous people like you, I got what I needed to take control of my life. For the young people who didn't ask to be put in unthinkable situations, Covenant House is there providing safety, hope, and a brighter future. Call or go online now for a gift of only $19 a month, just 63 cents a day. You can provide hot meals, safe shelter, medical care, and love to more than 2,000 young people who sleep at a Covenant House every night. One in 10 young adults will experience homelessness this year. Your gift can help reach them when they need it most. 
I didn't ask for my parents and my family to disown me. I didn't ask to end up in a homeless shelter. The beauty of it all is, is that I found Covenant House. The need is overwhelming, but your monthly support will make sure no young person is ever turned away. Call or go online right now to safeplacetosleep.org with your gift of just $19 a month. With your monthly donation, you'll receive this soft, comforting blanket as a reminder of the warmth and safety your gift will provide a young person tonight. Covenant House really helped me and really helped mold me into the woman I am today. If there's no help, Covenant House, where would I be today? Your monthly gift is urgently needed to reach young people in communities like yours who didn't ask to be put in unthinkable situations. Show them they're loved and not alone. Call the number on your screen or go online to safeplacetosleep.org. Welcome to NTD News Today. Here are today's top stories. Debris will soon be removed from the Baltimore bridge that collapsed. Find out more about the latest progress and we hear from a victim's family member. Officials now warning migrants to avoid being cooked to death by the sun. Arian Pazdar brings you more on their stern message now that we approach the hot summer months. Georgia passes new election rules how they could help independent candidates and keep non-eligible voters off voter rolls. American kids are getting free trips to China at the invitation of the Chinese Communist Party. Analysts say there's a secret agenda behind this program. The hidden influence of one of America's greatest adversaries embedded in American culture. We delve deep with NTD's Tiffany Meyer about her new film, Hollywood Takeover. And in this is NTD News Today, live from our NTD Global Headquarters. Here are Stephania Cox and Chris Beers. And we open with the latest updates on the bridge that collapsed in Baltimore. Cranes are set to begin removing the wreckage of the bridge. The dolly is almost as long as the Eiffel Tower. And the dolly has the key bridge on top of it. We're talking three to 4,000 tons of steel that's sitting on top of that ship. So we've got work to do. At least two cranes will be used to clear the channel. One of them is the largest crane on the eastern seaboard and can lift up to 1,000 tons. The Biden administration approved $60 million in immediate aid. Officials say they have to start clearing the wreckage before anyone can reach the bodies of the four missing workers. Using sonar equipment, authorities say they saw vehicles that appear to be encased in a superstructure of concrete and other debris. A victim's family is urging authorities to keep up search efforts. We are still waiting with faith and hope that they will find the body of our brother so that we can start the repatriation process, which is what we are most interested in. So, God willing, tomorrow the government will take another decision. In addition to removing the metal structures of the bridge, they will also continue with the search for the bodies. This man's brother was among eight construction workers filling potholes on the bridge when it collapsed. He's from Honduras. Authorities halted body recovery efforts because of dangerous conditions. And high danger and death, authorities now warning migrants that's what they might face trying to come to the U.S. illegally. This as we're moving closer to the hot summer months, which make the desert an unforgivable place. NTD's Arian Pazdar has more. The, the amount of death out here is likely to be unprecedented. CBP wants to shed light on the dangers of crossing the U.S.-Mexico border in the upcoming summer months, which they say is especially dangerous in the desert. They hosted a news conference in Arizona on Thursday, together with representatives from Mexico, Guatemala and Ecuador. CBP says immigrants who died trying to cross the desert often simply vanish. And they've died alone out there in the desert, the most horrific way you can imagine, basically, you know, being cooked by the sun and no one finds them for years. After animals have, have decimated the, car, the, the, the remains, there's nothing there except bleached bones. Latin American officials advise their citizens not to listen to things they might see online. 
saying coming to the U.S. illegally is like walking the park. The desert does not forgive. The temperatures do not forgive. No, perdona. No, se dejen engañar por eso. Do not be fooled by those messages that the border is open and that the crossing is immediate and that in less than two hours you can be from one side of the Mexico border to the United States border without any problem. That's a lie. The Tucson Air and Marine Branch says they often have to perform rescue operations using helicopters, which they say are very dangerous. They're literally hanging their lives on a 3 sixteenths of an inch cable. Officials say temperatures in the desert can reach up to 114 degrees Fahrenheit, with humidity levels similar to the Sahara Desert. Arian Pastar, NTD News. And uh, yesterday there was a discussion amongst officials from the Tucson, Arizona area, and we're, we will be discussing that now with Peter J. Forcelli, retired deputy assistant director from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms and Explosives, and a former group supervisor in Arizona under the ATF. Peter, welcome. What's your main takeaway from yesterday's event? Yeah, first of all, thank you for having me. But listen, I agree. I mean, the desert is a very dangerous place to be. Um, aside from the fact that there are wild animals down there, rattlesnakes, scorpions, uh, wild cats, uh, like bobcats, the, the, the climate there is very unforgiving. Um, for example, like even in the winter months, you can dehydrate down there because it's so dry and not be aware that you're dehydrating because the sweat evaporates from your body. So and then you have the sun, uh, is blazing sun, very few places to hide. If you look at the, the trees that are depicted, even in the footage that you showed, they lack foliage. So you can't get away from that sun. And then you have that dehydration threat. It's a, it's a very dangerous place to be. And I know from my interactions with Border Patrol down there that it wasn't abnormal to find uh, skeletons in the desert, to find dead bodies in the desert, to constantly have to rescue people um, from basically perishing because of the environment there. But when you look at the increase in volume of people coming to the border, it's a bit frightening because you imagine the death toll could be potentially much, much higher. Wow, that's incredible. And the impact on those who find these bodies, I, ma I imagine, would also be very difficult. Uh, what do you think of the, the impact of, you know, both former President Trump and President Biden visiting the border recently? How, how do you think that's impacted the morale of officers down there and locals? Well, I know they want to be able to do their job. There are existing laws that can be enforced that are not being enforced. Uh, and look, this leads to a dangerous situation because people feel like they can just come here. Um, and, you know, by trying to come here for a better life, and some people come here for other reasons as well, narco traffickers and whatnot, um, you know, they're exposing themselves to, to grave risk, and especially in the summer months. So I, I know the Border Patrol folks can do their job. They want to do their job. I think it's encouraging when they feel that their leaders support them and come down there and encourage you know them to, to be able to do what they signed on to do. But um, yeah, to your earlier point though, it's discouraging when these folks have to go into the desert and you know find these corpses of people who in many instances tried to come here to have a better life um, you know, yeah. for their families and for themselves. Yeah, Peter, more and more people across the US, US are getting concerned about this border issue. We can see that clearly in the polls. Is there anything that's missing, though, from the public debate on this topic that you think people on the ground can shed light on? Well, look, the reality is, is this is a national security issue. And I think folks are looking at it from a humanitarian point of view in many instances. But then, you know, look, we don't know who's coming into this country. And we are a nation of, of immigrants. I, I agree with that. My family came here from, uh, you know, generations ago. But they stayed on Ellis Island until they were able to you know, determine that they, they didn't carry a communicable disease. They weren't criminals. We have unvetted people coming into the country. And we have these increased threats around the world of terrorism and, and hostility. So I, I think that there are discussions that need to happen. And I think that our politicians need to get past their partisan talking points and actually have some productive conversation to securing the border because it's it's a matter of national security, but it's also a life-saving issue because when people feel like they can just trek across a very inhospitable desert and come here, they're going to try to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, as, as your reporting has already showed, it, it's a dangerous situation and there's loss of life for people who were coming here thinking that it's going to be an easy walk across um, you know, the desert, not realizing just how dangerous it is. And that's not even withstanding the cartel bandits who also prey on folks who are crossing into the, uh, you know, through the, through the desert. And, and again, like I mentioned earlier, some of the, uh, the animal life that lives in the desert that's not exactly kind to human beings. Mm, yes, that's a good point. Yeah, all of this, you know, forecasts seem to project that all this 
could be intensifying in the near future, at least, if nothing changes. But based on what you've seen and what officials on the ground are saying at the moment, what kind of action do you think would be effective at reining all of this in? Well, I think securing the border would be job number one, obviously, but that still doesn't prevent people from trying to get to the border. I think there needs to be messaging, um, and not just in the United States, in Latin American countries, which seems like it's happening, um, to warn people about the perils of trying to cross the desert to come into the United States. And again, there are, the perils are many. It's not just it's not just the environment. It's cartels. It's wildlife. It's just a dangerous place. So I think messaging is a big part of it, because I know there are folks out there who are trying to encourage people to come up here because the cartels make a lot of money in smuggling people. You know, it's one of the many avenues that they use to, to enrich themselves. Mm. All right. Thank you so much, Peter J. Forcelli. Great to speak with you. Thank you for having me. Happy Easter. Georgia law enforcement might soon have to work with immigration authorities. State lawmakers have now passed a related bill. This comes after the death of nursing student Lakin Riley. The bill would require local jails to check the immigration status of inmates and then work with federal immigration officials instead of sheltering people who are currently in the country illegally. Local law enforcement agencies can risk losing state funding for failing to work with immigration officials. Local officials could also face misdemeanor charges. The measure gained traction after the death of Lake and Riley, allegedly killed by an illegal immigrant. Georgia Democrats say the bill would turn local law enforcement into immigration police, making communities less willing to report crimes. And a nationwide operation against illegal immigrants with drug charges. ICE arrested over 200 immigrants with convictions for drug trafficking or multiple drug possessions. Authorities said yesterday the operation took place in the last three weeks across 25 different jurisdictions. The footage you see is from the actual nationwide enforcement. ICE was active in major cities such as Boston, Seattle, and Washington, D.C. The arrested suspects have previously been charged for being in contact with drugs such as fentanyl, cocaine, heroin, and more. Up ahead, Georgia passes new election rules, how the new measures could help independent candidates and help keep non-eligible voters off voter rolls. And over $200 billion, that's how much a new government report says the Biden administration spent on improper payments last year. The details in just a moment here on NTD News Today. Looking for a healthy and smooth tasting brew? Drop by Day's Coffee Roasters today and explore our wide selection of specialty grade small batch roasted coffee. Home to North America's first enzyme fermented coffee, we source a wide selection of specialty grade coffee beans from around the world and our baristas are ready to craft your customized brew. Visit Day's Coffee at 28 North Street, Middletown, New York. Come experience a brew like no other. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. I have never seen a production any better than this anywhere. Breathtaking. It is absolutely stunning. I feel better about the world. I feel uplifted. Invigorating. It was encouraging. Gave me hope. This has just been therapy for the soul. It's a must see. Must see. Make sure you see it. Make sure you see it. Coming to Lincoln Center, April 3rd through the 14th. Buy tickets now at Shenyun.com. Did you know indoor air quality can be five to even 100 times worse than outdoors? Meet the Air Doctor. It's your answer for clean air and the only hospital grade air purifier equipped with advanced ultra HEPA filters proven to improve your indoor air quality and overall health. 
Air Doctor circulates and triple filters the air in your room up to five times per hour. Say goodbye to pollen, smoke, mold spores, pet dander, even viruses, because the Ultra HEPA filter removes virtually 100% of dangerous contaminants down to 0.003 microns. That's 100 times smaller filtration than ordinary HEPA purifiers. This would have been in your lungs. Finally, get relief from allergies and asthma and reduce airborne disease. It's pulling the pollutants out. It's even pulling the toxic chemicals that our cleaning products leave behind. Call or go to tryairdoctor.com now. Get 40% off our best-selling air purifier. Call 1-800-791-3554. Call now. It's all is good, it, baby. Is it really all good? If you love me enough to routinely test your handyman skills, not to mention the strength of your marriage, then of course you'll visit nhtsa.gov slash the right seat to make sure I'm in the right car seat. Georgia now has tighter election rules. The changes involve challenging voter eligibility and qualifying for the state's presidential ballot. The move could impact the 2024 presidential race in the battleground state. The bill would allow any political party that has qualified for the presidential ballot in at least 20 states on Georgia's ballot. That could be a boost to independent candidates such as Robert F. Kennedy Jr. The bill also spells out what constitutes probable cause for upholding challenges to voter eligibility that could lead to voters being removed from the rolls. Probable cause would exist if someone is dead or if they've already voted or are registered to vote in a different jurisdiction. Democrats criticized the provision. They say it would overwhelm election administrators and disenfranchise voters. Calls to impeach a January 6th judge after he criticized former President Trump on a cable news program. It all started with Trump's criticism of another judge and their family member. District Judge Reggie Walton responded on CNN by expressing concern about his remarks. Walton said authority figures need to be cautious with their words to prevent potential harm. Some commentators like Julie Kelly and Josh Hammer advocated for impeachment proceedings against Judge Walton. Others like Mike Davis called for a judicial misconduct complaint. Judge Walton has presided over cases related to the January 6, 2021 Capitol breach. He had previously voiced skepticism about Trump's commitment to democracy during sentencing hearings. And a top Georgia GOP official is in the hot seat over voting illegally. A judge says Brian Pritchard illegally voted nine times while on probation for felony convictions and fined him $5,000. Despite being ineligible to vote until 2011, Pritchard registered in 2008. He claimed in a sworn statement at the time that he wasn't serving a felony sentence. The judge found Pritchard's explanations unconvincing, stating he should have known about his felony sentences. Pritchard stated in the past that he wanted to improve election integrity. He also questioned the legitimacy of the 2020 election results. A group of red states is lining up against the Biden administration's latest student loan forgiveness program. Eleven Republican attorneys general are suing the Biden administration over the SAVE plan student loan cancellation scheme. They argue that it's illegal because Congress didn't approve it. The Supreme Court blocked President Biden's plan to cancel $430 billion in student loan debt in 2023. So the administration introduced a new income-driven repayment plan for student debt forgiveness. There are concerns that the program's actual cost could exceed estimates and about taxpayers footing the bill. Kansas Attorney General Chris Kobach is leading the lawsuit. And Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton has opened an investigation into a Boeing parts supplier. The move comes after what he called recurring issues with some parts. Paxton said Thursday the potential risks with certain airplane models are, quote, deeply concerning and potentially life-threatening to Texans. The supplier's name is Spirit Aerosystems. Boeing and Spirit Aerosystems have been under recent scrutiny for safety and quality. On Monday, Boeing CEO Dave Calhoun announced he would leave by the end of the year. This follows concerns from regulators and airline customers after a panel blew off a 737 MAX 9 jet in January. A Spirit Aerosystems spokesperson said the company is focused on providing their customers with the best quality product. The Biden administration is taking new actions to electrify cars in the U.S. The Environmental Protection Agency, on EP, or EPA, is rolling out strict emission standards for heavy-duty vehicles. 
The regulations apply to heavy-duty trucks, buses, and l other large vehicles. Officials say this is part of an effort to cut greenhouse gases. The new rules will take effect for model years 2027 through 2032. The EPA calls this the strongest ever greenhouse gas emission standards of their kind. According to the Truck and Engine Manufacturers Association, less than 1% of new truck sales in the U.S. are currently electric. The EPA says they hope the new rules will boost that figure to 25 or 50% by 2032. The new emission standards drew criticism from industry groups. They say the rules could have negative economic consequences. And over $230 billion in new government reports as that's how much the Biden administration spent on improper or incorrect payments last year. The Government Accountability Office released the report. It says for fiscal year 2023, 14 federal agencies reported an estimated total of $236 billion in improper payments. Improper payments refer to payments that should not have been made or were made in the incorrect amount. Medicare and Medicaid accounted for $100 billion of that total. Following those programs are pandemic unemployment assistance and earned income tax credit. 74% of the improper payments were overpayments. Only 5% were underpayments. The Government Accountability Office concluded the federal government is unable to determine the full extent of its improper payments. The IRS's Criminal Investigation Unit says it has looked into tax and money laundering cases worth almost $9 billion that the more than 1,600 cases are related to COVID fraud. The agency says almost 800 people have been indicted for their alleged COVID-related crimes. 373 of them have been sentenced to time in federal prison. The Criminal Investigation Unit says it has a 98.5% conviction rate in prosecuted COVID fraud cases. And they say they plan on continuing their investigation since they now have additional resources provided by the Inflation Reduction Act. And Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin vetoed two bills yesterday. The first bill aimed to kickstart recreational retail sales of marijuana next year, while the second sought to enforce a minimum wage increase. Virginia became the first southern state to legalize marijuana in 2021. It adopted a policy change that allows adults 21 and up to possess and cultivate the drug. But the state didn't set up a retail sales at the time and still hasn't. Advocates say the disconnect is allowing the black market to flourish. Opponents have raised health and safety concerns regarding the further expansion of marijuana access. Youngkin has said he shared those concerns. Regarding the minimum wage legislation, Youngkin said the bill would create drastic wage mandates, raise costs on families and small businesses, jeopardize jobs, and fail to recognize regional economic differences across Virginia. The current minimum wage in Virginia is $12 per hour. The proposal would push it to $13.50 in 2025 and $15 an hour in 2026. And New York City will begin testing gun detecting technology in a pilot program at several subway stations. The announcement comes after several shootings on the subway system. Mayor Eric Adams announced yesterday that the NYPD will soon begin testing portable scanning machines at several stations. City law requires a 90-day notice period for the introduction of new surveillance technology. Adams, a former police officer, said this was the next step in keeping the New York City transit system safe. Police have seized 19 guns from people in the transit system so far this year, compared with nine guns in the same period in 2023. The Legal Aid Society, which defends New Yorkers who cannot afford lawyers, called the plan misguided and an invasion of privacy. An attorney with the organization said gun detection systems are flawed and frequently trigger false alarms, which could induce panic. Nearly four million trips are made on the city's subways on a typical weekday. New York State banned people from having guns in what it designates as sensitive locations, including public transportation in 2022. The ruling is being challenged by gun rights advocates. Caught on camera out of Metro Atlanta, a fiery crash ends in a dramatic rescue. Take a look. The crash happened in Johns Creek, Georgia, earlier this month. Police say a white Range, Ro Range Rover flipped and came to a crash stop in front of a home. You can see here. Body cam footage shows the moment an officer ran to help save the trapped female driver. 
An officer uses a fire extinguisher to put out the flames. He then breaks a window to pull the woman out. That's when the officer discovers an open bottle of alcohol between her legs. The driver was arrested and charged with DUI, reckless driving, and open container. And here's a major vehicle recall you need to know about. Kia has recalled more than 427,000 Telluride SUVs. According to the National Highway Tra Traffic Safety Administration, the SUV can roll away while in park. All Telluride vehicles made between 2020, 2023, and certain 2024 models are affected by the recall. The NHTSA report says a main component of the SUV's steering wheel may have been improperly assembled on the recalled vehicles. Owners are being asked to take the SUV to a Kia dealer to have an updated electronic parking brake software installed. Kia will reimburse you for the repair. And the great North American solar eclipse is coming up on April 8th, but it's critical you use ISO certified glasses to view it or you could damage your retinas. You can get some free glasses at several chain stores starting Monday. You can get two pairs of glasses per family at Warby Parker locations nationwide. More than 400 My Eye Doctor locations are giving away a pair while person while supplies last. And Jenny's Ice Cream is giving away four pairs with the purchase of one of four flavors that celebrate the eclipse. The offer is available online now and at its scoop shops nationwide beginning April 5th. Of course, the offers are only good while supplies last. And speaking of that, Schnips is giving away new meaning to the phrase for a limited time only. The snack company is celebrating the upcoming solar eclipse with a new product. It's the Solar Eclipse Limited Edition Pineapple Habanero and Black Bean Spicy Gouda. Wow, the company, company officials say these chips will bring flavor buds, quote, the bright heat of the sun with the spicy cheese of the moon. Yeah, wow. However, these special bags will only be available during the 4 minutes and 27 seconds of the eclipse, which is scheduled for April 8th. More information is available at sunchipsolareclipse.com. Still to come, an online tutoring site linked to the Chinese regime is getting the attention of U.S. officials. Florida's education chief is warning public schools not to use it. Find out why. And a Russian court extends the detention of an American journalist by another three months. The Kremlin says prisoner exchange discussions for the Wall Street Journal reporter are ongoing, but won't reveal any details of that more when we return. One single person is sometimes all it takes to change the course of history. With courage and great effort, our ancestors built the pillars we stand on today, leaving us a legacy of art, music, and wisdom. At the heart of almost every culture is our relation and connection with the divine. Today, their profound contemplations, beliefs, and great sacrifices have at times become misunderstood and even ridiculed. With the help of academic experts, we'll shine a new light on some of the most influential and courageous characters in history. And the miracles that surround them. One in five children worldwide are faced with the reality of living without food. No family dinners, no special treats, not enough energy to play. All around the world, hunger is affecting children's physical and mental health. Toddlers are suffering from acute malnutrition, which stunts their growth. Kids are forced to drop out of school so they can help support their families. Conflict, inflation, and climate have ignited the worst famine in our lifetime. And we are fed up. Fed up that hunger devours dreams. Fed up that hunger destroys joy. Fed up with the fact that hunger eats childhood. Help us feed the futures of children all over the world by visiting getfedupnow.org. For as little as $10 a month, 
You can join Save the Children as we support children and families in desperate need of our help. Now is the time to get fed up and give back. When you join the cause, your $10 monthly donation can help communities in need of life-saving treatments and nutrients, prevent children from dropping out of school, support our work with communities and governments to help children go from short-term surviving to long-term thriving. And now, thanks to special government grants, every dollar you give can multiply up to 10 times the impact. That means more food, water, medicine, and help for kids around the world. You'll also receive a free tote bag to share your support for children in need. Having your childhood eaten away by hunger is unimaginable. Get fed up. Call us now or visit getfedupnow.org. Next up, we have more updates on the Israel-Hamas war. Hostage and ceasefire negotiations will resume as the top UN court issues an order to Israel. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's office says it has authorized a delegation to Qatar and Egypt in the coming days. They will resume negotiations on the release of hostages held by Hamas. Earlier, the International Court of Justice ruled that Israel has to ensure basic food supplies to Gaza and end the famine there. The World Court says Israel can do this by increasing the number and capacity of land crossings. The court ordered Israel to submit a report in a month to detail the progress. However, it has no actual authority over Israel. Meanwhile, the top U.S. general says the Biden administration has not given Israel all of the weapons it needs. It has requested. The Pentagon didn't provide details on which weapon systems they are referring to. And a warning from Florida's education chief, public school districts should not use an online tutoring company tied to the Chinese Communist Party. The company is called Tutor.com. It partners with schools, colleges, and even the U.S. military to provide on-demand tutoring. In a statement posted Tuesday, Florida's education commissioner said ties to foreign countries of concern may compromise student data privacy, which he would never allow in Florida schools, he said. Tutor.com has denied any wrongdoing and said it's a U.S. company. Tutor.com is owned by Primavera Capital, a China-based company. Financial Times says its chairman, Fred Hu, is a member of the Chinese Communist Party, whose, member denies the mem whose company denies the membership. Back in China, he lectured at a Communist Party school and advised Chinese authorities, who is also a member of the CPPCC of Hunan Province, a political advisory body. In addition to Tudor.com, Primavera has also been buying up other U.S. education assets, including test prep company Princeton Review, Tudor.com, and a network of over 200 schools across the U.S. Free trips to China for American children with a hidden agenda. The Chinese Communist Party plans to invite over 50,000 American teenagers to visit China over the next five years. All costs would be taken care of by Beijing. The U.S. has banned Confucius Institutes on American campuses. So the Chinese Communist Party just invited young people over to China and the U.S. can't block that. That way Beijing can influence these people at a young age, and after they take up important positions later, they can influence U.S. society. Confucius Institutes are Chinese language and culture programs on U.S. college campuses, but it's partially funded by the Chinese regime. And Congress has cut off funding to schools with these institutes over concerns of Chinese influence. Since then, almost all the Confucius Institutes have closed, but some resumed operations later under other names. When was the last time you saw a film critical of the Chinese regime? It's probably been a while. That's because the Chinese Communist Party has been busy censoring Hollywood in exchange for access to Chinese markets. Hard to believe? And today's latest original documentary, Hollywood Takeover, will make you think otherwise. Steph and I spoke with the film's producer and host, Tiffany Meyer. She's also the host of NGD's China in Focus in our evening news program. Joining us now is Tiffany Meyer, producer and investigative journalist of the new film uh, Hollywood Takeover. Tiffany, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be with you both. What inspired you to make this film? 
It's quite a journey. <laughs> um, as I guess you mentioned earlier, I'm the host of China in Focus. I've been covering China for a while. And then Epic TV, our sister media, started doing a lot of documentaries. So I was given the opportunity to make a documentary about communist China's influence in America. And the original pitch was to do the government. But then I was like, first off, no one's going to watch that, <laughs> uh, even if it's an important topic, right? But I was like, Hollywood. And actually, Hollywood is where the power starts, because if you can control the arts or the culture, eventually, you're going to start reshaping the politics and everything. So I'm like, actually, if you want to talk about government infiltration, we have to start back here. And so that was kind of the initial start of this project. Some of the China experts that we speak to here on NTD have said that Really, we're in World War III already. We just don't realize it. You know, that's one take on, on the kind of antagonism between these two world powers. But Hollywood takeover, what is this takeover aspect? How bad is it? Right, so the name has two parts. So the first part is the Chinese Communist Party taking over and influencing Hollywood. So initially it was like, okay, if you want part of our market, you're going to have to get past our communist censors. You're going to have to start changing things to get into our market. Movies started changing things. They had a China version, rest of the world version. You know, so extra scenes that were filled in China or like extra movie time for the Chinese stars, stuff like that. That's not the world version. But then through time, it became, you know, with power, you want more. <laughs> so then Communist China was like, oh, well, you're going to have to do that version for the global release, not just for us. And so it kept going. So it has gotten to that point where people look at the you know the movies and they're like this isn't what i think of as a movie why am i leaving demoralized why do i hate my country now all these different things but maybe they don't understand why but that's kind of the influence that was happening throughout the years and then at the end because i want to be positive we're also doing the takeover as in we're seeing the rise of the independent studios who do want to still tell the stories they want to tell without the influence of an adversarial power like communist china and they're actually doing Doing quite well. And Tiffany, when you were making this film, and you have your head in, in China news every day, you're the host of China in Focus, but was there anything that surprised you um, as you were researching putting this together? Kind of two parts. One was just how basically, I guess, insidious this is, how this has just been since the very beginning, that there is no art for art's sake, that Communist China really sees everything in under them, they see Chinese people overseas is also part of theirs that they can control and that the arts is also something to further the party's goals, like every aspect of their society, everything is for that. So just the sheer extent of that, but then also when we were trying to get people to talk to us and then this director was telling us, no one's gonna talk to you because if they're associated with NTD, they're gonna get blacklisted in the industry and did not realize our company was that powerful. So that was kind of a fun thing wow. to realize. Yeah. And considering the pressure that you've been outlining here and that you've dug into in the film, it is quite remarkable when you mention all of the ways that people are coming out against it and they're wanting to spread the word, they're wanting to give you more information, and that even you yourself have been plunged into this and you're, you're making people aware of it. Um, what else is giving you hope about this? Because it was a very hopeful film in the end. Yes, so I think a number of things. One was like, since the pandemic, you saw a lot more people around the world, not just in America, waking up to, you know, what is communist China? What does that relate to me? And realizing the extent of the infiltration in their own country, whether it's like the education, the media, government, all of these different aspects. So you have that awareness and waking up happening to the point where you now see that bipartisan House Select Committee on the CCP, right? So Congress is taking notice. There's new legislation coming out about it. You also have the film industry itself, right? Where Top Gun originally removed these two jackets patches that were famous with the Taiwanese and Japanese flags because those are sensitive to communist China. There was backlash, especially from a Hong Kong human rights advocacy group being like, what are you doing? Because <laughs> like Top Gun is probably the most iconic American patriotic movie you could think of. But you see that basically kowtowing to something like the communist regime. But then because of that backlash, you saw Top Gun change it. So the final movie, the patches are back, right? And so you're seeing studios stand up for the stories they wanted to tell or their values and then succeeding to the point where people are now saying it pays to do the right thing. 
Yeah, and taking that message all around the world on our platform is also another part of that hope and something that you're engaged in every day. So I can really understand where you're coming from on that. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Great to speak with you about this. It's great being with you guys. And that was Tiffany Meyer, host and investigative reporter of Hollywood Takeover. You can watch that movie in full at Epic TV, and that's on the Epic Times website. You can also go to HollywoodTakeover.com. But stick around. A Russian court rejected an appeal from journalist Evan Gershkovich against extended detention. The criminal said prisoner exchange discussions for the Wall Street Journal writer are ongoing but must be carried out in silence. The Moscow court Tuesday upheld a decision by a lower court to extend the journalist's detention until June 30th. He's been behind bars for a year now. Russia's security service accused Gershkovich of being a spy, a charge he and the Wall Street Journal have denied. If convicted, Gershkovich faces up to 20 years in prison. The Kremlin says there are ongoing negotiations regarding a potential prisoner swap that could send the journalist back to the U.S., but a government spokesperson said these conversations would remain a secret. The Wall Street Journal today commemorating the one-year anniversary of the detention of Gershkovich. The paper intentionally left a large section of its front page blank to represent the missing work from him. The blank space is accompanied by these words, a year in Russian prison, a year of stolen stories, stolen joys, stolen memories, the crime, journalism. The journal says it will also print dispatches on Gershkovich and put a spotlight on the destructive consequences of authoritarian regimes. And here are some more headlines from Europe. A Russian veto yesterday ended a UN program. The UN is no longer monitoring sanctions against North Korea over its nuclear program. The West accused Moscow of violating the sanctions to buy weapons from Pyongyang for its war in Ukraine. Russia's veto marks growing animosity towards the US and its Western allies since Moscow's invasion of Ukraine more than two years ago. The UN Security Council resolution would have extended the mandatory monitoring of North Korea's nuclear program for one year. The current mandate expires at the end of April. The actual sanctions against North Korea remain in effect. Japan's chief cabinet secretary called Russia's veto regrettable. The UN Security Council had renewed the expert panel annually for 14 years. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said he called Speaker of the House Mike Johnson yesterday. The Speaker has held up a bill for months that would supply $60 billion in military and financial aid for Ukraine. The Louisiana Republican has indicated he will attempt to pass the bill for wartime funding for Ukraine as well as Israel once the House returns in April. Ukrainian troops have lost momentum on the battlefield, facing shortages of artillery supplies. U.S. assistance has been held up in Congress and the European Union. Zelensky said he briefed Johnson about the situation on the battlefield. Poland has dismissed a top general from his position as commander of a European military body. The country's defense ministry made the announcement this week after the country's counterintelligence service launched an investigation into his security clearance. The lieutenant general had been serving as commander of Eurocorps since June 2023. Germany and France founded the Corps in 1992 to support various European Union and NATO missions. The group's six framework nations include Belgium, Spain, Luxembourg and Poland. The Eurocorps has embarked on missions in the Balkans, Afghanistan, and Africa. The Polish officer had also served in Iraq and was a commander in Poland's military. Poland's defense minister, ministry said it will appoint a replacement immediately. And Poland says it will send troops and canine handlers to help secure the Olympic Games in France. The French government raised the country's terror alert warning to its highest level on Sunday following the Moscow concert hall attack. A Polish military spokesperson said details of the arrangement were still being worked out and would be provided at a later date. In mid-March, Paris authorities strengthened the police presence in a suburb near the Paris 2024 Olympic Village. Demonstrators protesting the death of a young man in a nearby town attacked a police station in the suburb on March 17th. The suspect had refused to stop his motorbike during a police chase earlier this month. The Paris Summer Olympics Games kick off on July 26th. Still to come in college basketball, March Madness continues tonight with four more games. Dave Martin joins us with a preview.
And an Easter egg kept untouched for over 80 years now sold at an auction. Find out the sweet story behind it more shortly here on NTD News Today. Hi, I'm Caleb and this is my story. I was born with osteogenesis imperfecta or brittle bone disease. I have broken my bones almost 200 times and I have had 11 surgeries. But I didn't let that stop me. I love to bike ride, climb, race, and I'm learning how to stand and walk. But I can only do all of this because of generous people like you and Shriners Hospitals for Children. Because of people like you, Shriners Hospitals for Children has helped more than 1.3 million kids just like me, regardless of their family's ability to pay. Shriners Hospitals for Children is only able to provide this world-class, life-changing medical care because of the generous gifts of people just like you. Because of you, I can ride my bike. I can play basketball. Because of people like you, I can run. I can smile. Will you send your love to the rescue today? When you go to loveshriners.org right now and give just 63 cents a day, you're helping kids just like me. Like me. Like me. When you give today, we'll send you this adorable Love to the Rescue Blanket as a thank you and a reminder of the love you gave to a kid just like me. Your gift, no matter how small, can help a child today. This is your moment to make a difference. When you pick up your phone, I know you have it right there and call to give. You're helping kids like me. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Please call or go online now. If operators are busy, please call again or give right away at loveshriners.org. Your gift makes a difference. Thank you for giving. If you're living with diabetes, this is the sound that could change your life. Great news for people living with diabetes. Now you can wear a continuous glucose monitor and eliminate routine finger sticks. The days of repeated painful finger sticks are over. Just call 800-215-1658. If you use insulin daily to manage your condition, a continuous glucose monitor could help you control your diabetes and reduce or eliminate those painful finger sticks. If you have Medicare or private insurance, US Med can deliver a CGM system right to your door. And if you qualify, there may be little or no cost to you. Shipping is free and we'll even bill your insurer directly. Call now to get your continuous glucose monitoring system so you can take control of your diabetes and get back to enjoying life. Just call 800-215-1658. That's 800-215-1658. And now for your sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin. Dave, the Sweet 16 continues tonight, but let's start with baseball. Um, yesterday was opening day. Uh, now we're looking ahead. Uh, who, who's the favorite this year to win the World Series? Well, according to FanDuel Sportsbook, the Los Angeles Dodgers have the actually highest odds. Now, I would guess they were probably already in the conversation for number one before they signed Shohei Otani for $700 million and that star Japanese pitcher Yoshinobu Yamamoto for another $325 million. I mean, imagine what the odds will be next year with them when Otani is healthy and can actually pitch. At number two are the Braves, who won it all three years ago. They're followed by Houston, who won it two years ago, and then the Yankees in fourth. Now, I'm a little surprised the Yankees are this high, especially having to put ace pitcher Garrett Cole on the 60-day injured list to start the season. I mean, he's not only their best pitcher, he's probably the best pitcher in the game at this point. Now, behind them in fifth are finally the reigning champion Texas Rangers. Seems kind of low if you ask me. And then the Baltimore Orioles, who had the most wins in the American League next, last year, are next. So those are your top six, anyway. Meanwhile, the New York Mets, they have the highest payroll in the game at $340 million. But clearly, there's not much confidence from the odds makers that they spent it the right way. Now, Dave, switching gears here a bit. There was an anonymous survey done by the BBC that showed that more than 70% of British sportswomen felt uncomfortable with transgender athletes competing in female sports, while 67% felt uncomfortable speaking publicly about the issue. Now, you've talked with a number of American women about this. Do these results ring true here as well? Yes. 
And I always ask those uh, American female athletes what the consensus is among the female athletes that they know, because of course they know plenty of other other female athletes. And what they say backs up these results that most every female athlete does not feel comfortable competing against transgender athletes, you know, biological males, let alone sharing a locker room with them. But of course, they fear talking about it in public too, for fear of being labeled, you know, as a bigot or something along those lines. Now, there was also an interesting paper published in the Scandinavian Journal of Medicine by 26 academics that challenged the IOC's reasoning for including transgender athletes in women's Olympic sports, saying you have to consider male development rather than testosterone levels. In other words, if you've already gone through male puberty, lowering your testosterone levels afterwards really doesn't do anything. I mean, look at, look at that collegiate swimmer, Leah Thomas, formerly known as Will Thomas, was ranked in the 500s in the NCAA as a male, switched to female and competed against the women, and was suddenly ranked number one in at least one race. So I don't think it's coincidence that this isn't an issue with transgender athletes in men's sports. And Dave, going back to March Madness, the Sweet 16 kicked off yesterday with four games, uh, there's four more games this evening. Uh, what, do you, what, do, what does tonight's contents look like to you? Yeah, well, we had a couple surprises last night. Alabama beat uh, top seeded North Carolina. Clemson up at second seeded Arizona. So if your brackets weren't already busted, they probably are now. But full disclosure, mine are completely busted. I got all four picks wrong last night. But you know what? That's never stopped me from guessing before. So tonight we start with NC State Marquette. Now NC State, they are the lowest seeded team left. I think uh, Marquette only takes them down. That's followed by Purdue-Gonzaga, which really should be a good matchup. I think Purdue, which is the top seed, I think they will prevail. Then the late games are Duke versus Houston and Creighton-Tennessee. I think Houston takes down Duke, especially since it's played right next door in Dallas. And I think Tennessee prevails over Creighton, which should be a very close game. And then Saturday and Sunday, we'll have the Elite Eight starting. All right, Dave, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Dave. This weekend, many families are celebrating Easter, of course. This is the meaning of Easter, of this key holiday, changing for people, though. I went out to ask how people view the holidays these seasons. Let's take a look. Easter is coming up this Sunday, but what is the true meaning of Easter? This pivotal Christian holiday lives on in an increasingly secular world. What do people in New York City have to say about it? I spoke with some of them. What does Easter mean to you? Um, well, I was raised Catholic, and so it's a great celebration for me. And it's a time where I reflect on how I've been behaving with people. How, I, if I'm satisfied with that, do I want to make changes? It's a time of reflection. It means memory. It means uh, hope. It means uh, redemption. Normally, Easter means to me spending time with your family. It means more to me than Christmas, actually. It's uh, huge. Uh, I'm Catholic, so yeah, I think the whole religion of Catholicism is based on what happens in Easter. So uh, it means a lot, yeah. So what does Easter mean to you? Savior of humanity. It's a uh, sinful man being um, reconciled with God. Uh, Easter means everything. For, for me, Easter is a great family time. Uh, I celebrate Greek Easter, uh, which is actually not till May this year. Usually there's a one week difference between regular, what we call regular Easter and Greek Easter. This year it's more like a couple of months. Um, but it's great, you know, there's a combination of a spiritual time, but also a great family time where we get together and celebrate with relatives who we don't typically see. Easter for us is kind of our Persian New Year. So we have a Persian New Year that's the first day of uh, the spring day. So that's what kind of Easter kind of reminds me of that as well too. And we celebrate by, again, you know, as we say before, we kind of clean the houses, we bring up, put greens up, we have, you know, everything that we wear is brand new, showing it's a festive new year, so we get to put it you know, out with the old and in with the new. Do you feel like the meaning of this Christian holiday, Easter, has changed uh, over the years? Oh, immensely. It's not any longer a Christian holiday. It's something the Americans made up, which is like bunnies and rabbits. I don't get it. I really do not get it. Yeah, I feel like uh, I, I do think that Easter is kind of undervalued. I think uh, as time has gone on, people don't value as much as they should. You know, we have a crisis of faith in the United States. 
uh, and I hope that people take this Easter as an opportunity to renew their faith uh, and the overall importance. You know, we live in a society that's obsessed with things, money, uh, lusting after uh, things of the world, and at the end of the day, none of that goes with you. So hopefully it's an opportunity for people to renew their faith in, in God. So there you have it, what Easter means to people today in the words of a handful of folks we met in New York City. Chris Beers, NTD News. And there aren't many children that can resist eating a chocolate Easter egg, but one child in Wales saved hers for more than 80 years. The egg has now been auctioned for charity, and the sweet story behind it can be told. Sybil Cook was just nine years old when she was given an Easter egg in 1939. Although she loved chocolate, somehow she stopped herself from ever eating it. Her uncle warned her to save it because a gift like this would be hard to come by during the Second World War. And so the girl treasured the treat for her entire life. The egg still has its blue and white paper, complete with a decorative garden scene and a young girl holding a watering can. Cook died in 2021, aged 91. The egg was auctioned by Hanson's auctioneers earlier in March. It fetched a price of roughly $250. The money raised will be given to charity. Well, that's all for today's news. Thank you for tuning in. As we head into the Easter weekend, we hope you are able to spend a lovely holiday with your family. And TD wishes you and your loved ones a wonderful, happy Easter this weekend. See you next week.